Um, my day job is, for 25 years, has been trying to move the bar on computation, whether that's applied to data science or not. And that's what the Wolfram Group of Companies does, making things like Wolfram Alpha and Mathematica used uh, widely in Sweden and elsewhere. But what I was asked to talk to you about today was our project to fundamentally change math education around the world. And I want to start by explaining that there's a major crisis in the world, not just in Sweden, but everywhere. The math that people are being taught isn't matching up to what they need. If you listen to industry, governments, uh, the kids themselves, and the teachers, and parents, everybody associated with math thinks it's not working. Yet in the outside world, math is more important than it has been at any point in human history. And the question is, why, and what can we do to fix this? Well, I think there's a very simple underlying problem. The subject in schools is fundamentally different to the subject in the outside world, and that chasm is growing. The basic difference can be summarized as this. In education, we spend almost all the time teaching people how to calculate things by hand. In the outside world, we spend our time problem solving using the best tools, computers, most of the time to do that. And those subjects are fundamentally diverging at a rate of knots. And unless we fix that underlying problem, maths education everywhere, including in Sweden, will fail us. So I want to talk through what we need to do to fix it and how Sweden could be a leader in changing, making that change, and I think is, is well positioned to do that, and, and with industries like Ericsson. So let's start. Why are we learning maths? question many kids would have. And in particular, why is everyone supposed to be learning maths? It's a very central subject in our societies. Well, I think there are three good reasons for this. Technical jobs that are so crucial to our economies and individuals. What one might call everyday living, the ability just to function in a modern society today needs you to be much more quantitative than it ever did in the past. And thirdly, what you might call logical mind training. Being able to logically think through things, whether explicitly for maths or not. Those, I think, are three good reasons why everyone needs to learn maths. What is maths? What are you actually doing when you either do maths or learn it? Well, I think you're going through these four steps. You're defining question. If I go on too long in this room, how long can we all survive if it were airtight? <laughs> right? That's a computation we're laying down. Then you need to translate it to some expression that allows us to compute that. That's the abstraction. Then we need to compute the actual answer, get the answer from that in, in some abstract form. And then we need to take it back and answer the real question. You know, three hours and 42 minutes or whatever it is. What we're doing at the moment is we're spending all our time in schools forcing people to do step three by hand. And the result of that is they're not doing these other steps very much. They're focused on just the calculating, which computers can do much better than them. So we should be using computers much more to do the calculating and students much more to do steps one, two, and four and allow them to do this high-level conceptual problem solving. Some of the things we heard in the last talk are not things that are going away anytime soon because computers are going to take them over. See, I see maths as a problem-solving process where you go through these steps up a kind of helix until you get to an answer. You may have to go around this several times until you get to an answer which actually fulfills answering your question. So what I'm arguing is maths is a different subject to calculating, and essentially every government around the world has muddled this up. Maths is a bigger subject than calculating, and while we're at it, of course, STEM, science, technology, engineering, and maths is obviously a bigger subject than maths, but is heavily reliant on the basic skills of maths. And I would even put uh, ICT and computer science into that mix as reliant on those basic, what I call basic math skills. And I just want to give an example here. This is something that many people have to do in school. They have to solve a simultaneous equation. But the thing is, the equation may not come out that way from the problem you're trying to solve. It might come out muckier. That's a cubic equation. I just feed it into my computer and do it. It's the same basic idea. There's an equation to represent a problem, and I need an answer. What's shocking is that most kids out of their school, out of 12 years of learning maths, couldn't solve that. And yet I can do it in a second on my computer. So wh why are we spending time teaching? In fact, it gets worse than that. If uh, Siri willing, I can talk to my phone, solve x cubed plus 2 equals 2y, and y minus x equals 5. 
And uh, Siri willing, we'll get an answer, which I'll try and show you here. Uh, and it may even be, in many cases, you can actually speak to your computer if, uh, if the network decides to cooperate. Here we go. Which it did, I'm pleased to say. We obviously don't have 5G yet. Um, but there is, I've talked to my computer and I've got a solution that essentially no kid after 12 years of schooling can do by hand. You go ask why we're spending 12 years of their lives doing that when you can do it by talking to your phone. Now I want to contrast two topics here. There's computer based and computer assisted. What I mean by computer based is the subject in the outside world changed because computers me mechanized the calculating over the last decades. Fundamental shift. Computer assisted, which we were hearing some about in the, in the last talk, is taking p pedagogy and transforming it because we have modern technology. I'm absolutely for that in all subjects. I think it's a very important part of whether it's history or maths. My argument specifically in this talk is about the subject matter of maths, which fundamentally has changed in the real world in a way that I don't think history has. We need to get the right subject or we're not going to succeed. So my argument is better deployment of the wrong subject won't fix the problem. And essentially, however much you apply new, tech, new ideas to how to teach the wrong subject, it's still the wrong subject. And we need to fix that. And unless we understand that, and picky, unless governments, politicians, and industry understand what they really require there, it will fail. This is a major problem. So around the world, I reckon that about 21,000 life, lifetimes per year, average student lifetimes, are spent learning hand calculating that they'll never use. That's a big investment of lives. And it's a bit like people say, well, don't you need some people to know this? Yeah, sure. If people are interested in it, that's great. Should you force the world's population to learn ancient Greek? No, I don't think so. For some people, it's a very interesting subject. That's great. They should pursue it. And the individualized learning that I think we'll see coming up will really help people to go down tracks they're interested in. But if we think there's a societal need for a subject like maths, we need to make it the right subject. And what's really exciting is I think the right subject is both more practical and more conceptual. To use maths is a hard business. You need to be conceptually understanding it, but it's also more practical. And so these arguments that happen often in politics between should we make the thing more theoretical or more vocational, these are, in my view, false dichotomies which we do not need to debate. And particularly in a country like Sweden where you have such a, a, a large sector of of industry that's high tech, that requires very high tech, you know, people who understand maths and related STEM subjects well in order to perform in those industries. You, you need all of those people coming through. Perhaps a key point that is most misunderstood, if you remove the computer from maths education, you will remove most of the context. The reason we have mobile telephony, we have data science, we have statistics in the way that we do today is because computers mechanized the hell out of calculating. Those subjects did not exist before computers mechanized calculating. So when we give people contextual problems to do in school, if you want real context, you can't do the problems without a computer. It's no good giving them statistics with five data points. Nobody ever did that. No, it doesn't work. It's a different problem. So you've got to have the computer to have them do the right subject. There is no alternative to that. And often this is misunderstood. You know, why don't we do thermodynamics problems for primary schools? It's quite easy to get a handle on this if you're using a computer and you can simulate things. Another thing that's wrong is computer uh, maths courses are labeled by, you know, you probably had to do things like uh, matrices and solving simultaneous equations. Wrong labels. You should be labeling things by problems you actually want to solve. Design a currency. Should I insure my laptop? What's a beautiful shape? How much do you need to compress a photo, video, or music before you notice? You see, the sort of things we're no doubt being discussed in mobile telephony. How much compression you need? What's the best algorithm for compression? Things of this sort are really important things to be actually playing with uh, at an early age. So here's an example we have deployed in, uh, in the curriculum we are, we're working on, I'll talk about it in a moment. This is an example where we want to do some data science. 
So we divided the classroom into two groups, and we asked half the students to actually toss coins to see whether they got heads or tails and note it down, and the other half to actually um, uh, to, to go through and simulate and pretend that, uh, that they were tossing coins, but just type it into the computer. The question is, can the teacher tell who's cheated? Well, the answer is, on the whole, the answer is yes. So I just typed this in, fake, and the teacher could tell, if I were the teacher, that actually this is probably a fraud. This is a very simple version of what you do in data science to do things like credit card fraud detection. This is an early stage of that, and yet a student aged 12 or 14 can get hold of this sort of issue quite easily if you do computer-based maths. Now, the areas of maths are quite interesting. What are modern ways in which maths gets used? Data science, key area, growing. We need a lot of people educated to know how to do data science. Signal processing, crucial area, particularly in Ericsson, for example. Geometry, a modern part, uh, old name, modern subject. Modeling, how do you model things mathematically? And, and how, what's the inside of maths that you need to do that? Those are some of the modern areas. Now, we heard a bit about computer science. I, the, the modern idea of coding in schools, which has spread from, I think, Estonia to the UK to the US and perhaps to Sweden as well, is, I think, crucial. But I think governments have often misunderstood why coding is so important. See, I think of maths as a process for doing STEM or life. Coding is a way to express that. How do you write down what you want to do? Well, you don't write it down in the modern world with funny squiggles. You write it down by writing code. It's simply the way you communicate in the modern world. You write code. And um, you know, it's, it's crucial to understand that as the backbone to writing maths. A bit like you do handwriting in English or Swedish. You need to do coding as part of maths, in my view, in the early years. I won't dwell on this, but clearly one of the problems that governments particularly have to attack is assessment. If you've got the wrong assessment system, you're going to have that's going to drive people to do the wrong work. So if we have assessments that test how well people can solve quadratic equations, we aren't going to test properly whether they can do data science with a computer. And governments need to take note of that because assessments still often run centrally from governments. So I think um, industry has a great role here in setting their own assessments in, for people they want and, and people getting used to how those operate. Again, I won't spend much time on this, but to say that one of the things that challenges we've seen is actually working out what the outcomes are you want from maths. One of the things I wanted to highlight here is the idea that you've got to learn how to plan and manage computations. You know, we stick people out of the world with these fake problems they did in school, which probably bored the pants off them. And we then hope that they can go into Ericsson and start simulating a, uh, a network. Well, stuff comes up. It doesn't work neatly. The computers can't run the programs you write. There are all sorts of problems that come up. You need to educate people on how to manage those problems. It's a bit like running a company. You don't tell people to read the book and then give them a 500-person company to run without any training on the job. So it's crucial that we actually understand real things that people need to do. For a few minutes, I want to address why now and why Sweden. So I think generally there are three reasons why this is a crucial reform now. The pressure on maths is mounting around the world. Just Sweden's PISA results are a good example of how pressure mounts. And those a lot were predicated on apparent math skills. Now, I may, you can agree or disagree with what PISA does, but there is some sort of level there. I, I, I'm going to argue later that I think it's a, a, a playing field that we should be on a different playing field somewhat. So there's a huge impetus around the world. There's a huge impetus from industry saying they don't have people to employ. Mostly in Europe, in Western Europe and in the US, we are importing people from the rest of the world because we can't train enough ourselves. There's ubiquity of devices, as we were hearing earlier. You know, there isn't a problem in a country like Sweden about the devices, really. People have the devices to use. That's a fairly new thing, that they're all ready with those. And also there's the interface. Computers are much easier to interface with than they were, and the computational power, of course, underneath that really um, makes it easy. Now, we, we at Wolfram have been working on some of these interfaces. This is an example of a computable document, and this is a sort of uh, scientific paper, economics paper, but it's a bit different from your traditional economics paper because it actually sort of works. 
in the middle of it, you can actually do things. And so it's sort of a mixture of an app and uh, an interactive um, paper. And so this is a very good modern way of decision making by being able to build simply things that you use to actually trade. And this was used in the Texas state, uh, state Senate, I think, for deciding whether they should buy hurricane insurance. So that's one sort of interface. And of course, you can use that pedagogically as well. Another thing we've been working on hard is um, a language, a computer language that mixes maths and coding. We call it the Wolfram language. Actually, we've been working on this for 25 years, but it's not been in that form. And I thought I'd just take a minute to live a bit dangerously here and just try and build you a little app live. So what I want to do is edge detect myself. Um, you can see I'm running off my local camera here. And you know, it's kind of nice that you can just type in a thing like that and actually do a piece of math. But now what I might do is I might try and give myself some options, not just edge detect, but actually give myself multiple effects. So this is a typical kind of immediate coding thing that you want people kind of to be able to do. You want people to be able to say, OK, let's, um, uh, let's have the uh, uh, effect go from uh, edge detect. And let's uh, say we can do another one, which is blurring, et cetera, et cetera. So you could do, uh, except I've. It uh, never works as well in real time as uh, when you try and do it. Uh, let's see, what have I done here? I think I might have to skip over this. Uh, that's, that's annoying when that happens. Uh, but uh, uh, I've got a bracket out here. It's always harder in front of people to do this. You know, it's a surprising, surprising effect. But anyway, um, let me, uh, oh, that's, that's annoying. I like to get these things actually working. Um, but uh, I think let me skip over that and come back to it. If uh, while the Q&A is happening, I'll make sure that works. Um, so look, here's the key point I'd like to make, which is you have to stand on the power of automation in any field in education or in, in life and not try and simulate it. So here's what I'm trying to, to say in a sense, which is that you know, there are machines now which do computation very well, better than any human. In fact, better than any imagination that humans had that they could get machines to do it. You need to use education to move up from the machinery level you're at. And right now, we're at that machinery level. So we need to stand on it and have education be more conceptual so that we can actually do things in real life that we need to do. And STEM is the thing that just got automated. You know, 150 years ago, it was industry and machines that physically made things that got automated. Now it's, so to speak, the power of, uh, um, of co computation. And so we need to work up from those machines and not compete with them. And that's why we started computerbasedmath.org a few years ago to build a new curriculum for the world to make math, uh, this new math. And I believe it's inevitable, either math will be run out of business in 20 years as a mainstream subject, or it'll be a subject a bit like what we're trying to build. Um, Estonia is the first country to implement this. We have a pilot running in Estonia, directed by the government, on statistics in secondary schools and high schools. But the good news is we've also got a small trial started in Sweden. And I won't try and pronounce the name of the school, though I was briefed on this uh, for you. Um, but that's where it's running. Uh, and uh, that's starting, I think, on November the 17th. So that'll be an exciting thing to, to look at. I would say Sweden has a profile of a country that could really leapfrog others. We heard about how Sweden's lower in PISA than some other countries, some of your neighbors like Finland and Estonia. But I actually think if you do computer-based maths, you can leapfrog that on the, on the STEM side of things. Because you can build a curriculum that engages people much more and is much more relevant to the kind of particularly industries you have in Sweden. It's a bit like how the UK was very early with universal education in the 19th century and managed to uh, do very well out of that by being first. I think Sweden is, is in the early stages, uh, could, could be very, uh, very good. Um, we're looking for partners to help with this and hopefully to drive the political vision here uh, and also the push from industry. So I thank very much to Ericsson for this event. Uh, so I hope you can all help us unscramble the maths conundrum around the world. Thanks very much. Thank you. Yeah, okay, I'll stay. Okay, so